they call him Saint. They call him John, Father John. And then when he became a saint, it was Saint John. And uh, the book, The Ladder of Divine Ascent, was so popular, especially among monastics, that they started calling him Saint John of the Ladder. So that's when we say Clematis, we're also it's just Latin for the Ladder. So um, he was alive in the uh, sixth and seventh centuries. Um, and the book was written for a particular monastery. Um, one of the fathers of the monastery asked him to write just on his experience Excuse of being a monastic and different different steps um, along the way. So that's kind of important if you take on reading it or even reading parts of it to understand is that it's not written to us people living in the world. It's written to monastics. There's a lot in it that's to offer us, but at the same time, there's a lot of language that's going to seem kind of foreign. And the more we can kind of understand some of those terms, the more it opens it up. Uh, but as we, um, when, you, when you first get into it, some of it seems pretty tricky. Um, so especially getting the parts about, about talking about different disciplines, different all-night vigils, seems that just in our day-to-day -day lives aren't really possible. And, and St. John even speaks of that, that this is, these are some of the things we can do as monastics, but these are things they can't do living in the world. At the same time, here are things living in the world that they're able to do uh, that are, are going to be easier for them. These are the challenges. Whereas with monastics, we're going to have a completely different set. There's going to be overlap, but, but they're not all the same. I uh, read through the book. Uh, hey, St. John used a lot of metaphors, and they get. I, I'm laughing sometimes reading it, just some of the ways he describes it. So, you'll, you'll hear a few of those as I go on to here. Another thing is it's a practical guide. This is not written like some of the, my saint, St. Dionysius, the Ariel Pig guy. He writes very theologically. That's not at all what this book is. He's writing trying to get you to, to take a step on the ladder. It's, Father Tom used the analogy of the 12 steps, the, the big one. And I, I see a lot of similarity. If we look at if we look at the 12 step program as getting out of the addiction of, of alcohol or drugs, then you could look at this as getting out of the addiction of the passion and sin. So um, every year this is read during Lent at monasteries. Um, so, if for the monastics, they're probably reading it at least 40 times through by the end of their life. So, pretty impressed when you think of that. How important a role it has compared to other books outside of the Bible. Um, going over some of the themes, uh, the big one is the passions and dispassion. At first, I think to a modern ear, that's a little hard to understand because I've always thought of passion as something good. If you're passionate, you're, you have life, you have energy towards something. That's really not how they're using it, how St. John is or other, other church fathers of the time. If you think of passion as the root of it is passive, that gives you a little better understanding. So, so essentially when, when you, we say passion, it's a, it's a giving yourself over, giving control to something that's going to pull you away from God and pull you to, to sin. So an example would be pride, lust, uh, gluttony. All these things are things that, that we can we can get control of, but instead we we give away. We give away that control in our mind. Um, they, on the other hand, this passion would be breaking free of that through through the virtues like self-control, obedience, different different things like that. We're breaking free of it, and then we open up. You hear, like St. Paul used the term, being a slave to Christ. And th this would be what he's talking about, is we break free from being a slave to the passions, and then we turn to being a slave for Christ. Uh, and that, that moves us to, to prepare for theosis, or union with God. Uh, I really love this icon, because, so if we look at it, thinking of passion and dispassion, we're starting off down here, when, when we start our ascent, we're starting off in, ruled by passion. And as you can see, we've got a lot, a lot of them getting dragged down. Here we have ones that have fallen, fallen down and been pulled down by the demons. 
as we go up, we eventually hit that, the, the final steps, and we, we reach a state of dispassion. And that state of dispassion is preparing us to embrace Christ in eternity. Cool thing about orthodoxy is that we don't just believe this happens after death. And what we read with some of the saints is this state can be achieved in our lifetime. And we have different examples like Saint Seraphim where we see that divine fire, that light coming through even though he was still alive. Um, another interesting thing with Saint John is he talks about um, residual passions that they're almost like God's using them. So we see up here the, the priests falling. We see people who are, would be considered holy men. Um, there, so what St. John says is that sometimes we can have something like gluttony or, or fear. There can be different things that, yes, it's a passion, but that passion could be keeping us from something like spiritual pride. So in a way it could be keeping us humble, knowing that we're always still fighting a certain temptation. And that could, God could use that to continue throughout our lives so that we never fall to possibly a greater passion. So, let's see here, I'm going to go just go through something, kind of unpacking this passion, dispassion. In the Divine Liturgy, um, before we read the Gospel, the priest says, Enlighten my mind with the light of understanding of thy holy Gospel, my soul with the love of thy cross, my heart with the purity of thy word, my body with thy passionless passion, I don't know if any of you have heard that thought. What is what's that passionless passion seems kind of like a, a paradox. Um, but he's getting at this passionless, so not ruled by the passions. But then the passions with a capital P is that passion would be on the one hand the passion of Christ on the cross, but on the other, that's the divine radiance of God coming through. So I'm gonna go through a few. I just kind of picked out a few of the steps that really stuck out to me. Um, Again, as you read, if you read through it, some of them are some of them are going to easily you're going to connect with. Others are going to be really challenging. Sometimes that can be just an issue of starting to understand the language and, and setting he's speaking to. And again, it's not a theological work like some of the other other church fathers. So Saint John again, and again is is trying to push us to to personally experience this. He's He's trying to bring it as close as he can to us. So he's there's there's things like like having a spiritual father that he's going to really put a lot of importance in, which also remind me of the twelve steps where you're getting a sponsor. That's someone who's been personally experienced that, and they're so they're going to be able to walk you through. Um, we think of things like confession that kind of start we start to understand that. Um, so I'm going to start out with step nine, which is on malice. Uh, another translation would be on the remembrance of wrongs, which I, I really like that it kind of explains it a little better. So I'm going to start off reading from Matthew. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive you your sins. So this, the way he talked about this, to me it felt like he's almost saying there's nothing, there's no passion more toxic than the remembrance of wrongs. And when you read through the Gospels, you kind of start to get that, that, that we're not, if we're not able to forgive others, we're not being forgiven by God. So how he explains what it is, he says the remembrance of wrongs comes as a final point of anger. It is a keeper of sins. It hates a just way of life. It is the ruin of virtues, the poison of the soul, a worm in the mind. It is the shame of prayer, a cutting off of supplication, a turning away from love, a nail piercing the soul. It is a pleasureless feeling, cherished in the sweetness of bitterness. It is never-ending sin, an unsleeping wrong, rancor by the hour, a dark and loathsome passion. It comes to be, but has not offspring, so that one need not say much about it. So, I mean, that stuck out to me, the sweetness of bitterness, just that, like, delighting in being bitter and, and not forgiving someone. And also, they even, to him, he's looking at it as it's so toxic that it's not even producing other passions. It's, it's destroying even other passions. It just, 
consumes your entire being. So as for what we can do about this, he says, if after great effort you still fail to root out this thorn, go to your enemy and apologize, if only with empty words, whose insincerity may shame you. Then as conscience, like a fire, comes to give you pain, you may find that a sincere love for your enemy may come to life. So he's saying that we're to forgive others, we're to follow God's word whether or not we feel like doing it. The feelings are secondary. When we're called to do something, we're called to forgive, so we need to step in and forgive someone. If the feelings come later, which, which he's saying they most likely will, uh, that's, that's great, but that's not... That's not a prerequisite, that's something that's a, something that comes after, that's an effect of it. Um, and, and he talks about this later, that as we continue to forgive and just choose to act, that we develop a state of, he calls it a state of repentance, which I always love this idea that when we think of forgiving others, we're not just forgiving others, we're also repenting to them. We're repenting because we held on to it, because we were unable to forgive them immediately. So, he's talking about that, he says, Some labor and struggle hard to earn forgiveness, but better than these is the man who forgets the wrongs done to him. Forgive quickly, and you will be abundantly forgiven. To forget wrongs is to prove oneself truly repentant, but to broad on them, and at the same time, to imagine one is practicing repentance, is to act like a man who is convinced he is running, when in fact he is fast asleep. So, that's Father Redeem, I remember in a sermon he, he preached that of a, of a monk that was just eaten up by this, this person who had wronged him, this other monk who had wronged him. So they don't talk for years, and eventually the monk goes to, he prays to God, and he's, you know, I'm, I'm at a point where I can go forgive him. So he goes and asks for forgiveness. The monk slams the door, does it in his face, you know. So he goes to his spiritual father, and he says... I don't know what happened, I don't want to do, I feel like I prepared myself, and I'm ready to forgive him. And so his spiritual father tells him, no, go repent, go ask him for forgiveness. So he goes and does that, and boom, it turns right around where the other monk's asking him for forgiveness, they're embracing, and they're united again. So, so that, that play, is, that's always there, that, that as we forgive, we also repent. So then I'm going to move on to step 26, uh, is on discernment. So they, St. John points out a lot of different types of discernment. Um, discernment of our motives, discernment of God's will, discernment of our nature. And again, he, he keeps going back to personal experience. You've got, you got a personal experience. We're not reading this just to get something in our heads. We're reading it to take us up the ladder to God. So... He says that some labor and oops, sorry, next one. He says that those who have been humbled by their passions should take part, even if they tumble in every pit, even if they are trapped by every snare, even if they suffer every disease. Still, after their return to health, they become light to all. They prove to be doctors, beacons, pilots. They teach us the characteristics of every malady, and out of their own experience, they can rescue those about to lapse. So we got to learn from our mistakes, and we're the people that have made the mistakes. If instead of turning that into sorrow, <coughs> turning that into I'm not good enough, but instead looking at it as I have an opportunity that God has given me to turn this into a way of teaching others, and also warning them of possible pitfalls that, that I've experienced. So another thing he says is discernment of circumstances for using different things. So it's not, what I love about it, he's not saying that, he doesn't just write it and say, all right, here it is, this is what you do, every circumstance is going to work. He's, he's also drawing us to discern, to have, is this going to work for that person? Do I understand that person's heart? Because if we don't understand another person's heart for our own, we're going to make, we're going to fall into error. So this is how he explains that. He says, one man's medicine can be another man's poison. And something can be a medicine to the same man at one time and a poison at another. So I've seen an incompetent physician who by inflicting dishonor on a sick but contrite man produced despair in him. And I've seen a skillful physician 
who cut through an arrogant heart with the knife of dishonor, and thereby, I love, I love this imagery, drained it all of its foul-smelling pus. <laughs> I have seen a sick man striving to cleanse his impurity by drinking the medicine of obedience, by moving, walking, and staying awake. That same man, when the eye of his soul was sick, did not move, made no noise, and was silent. Therefore, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. So stillness at a time might be a medicine that, that will help us. Another time, we may need, need to be active. Um, and also, he talks about discerning motives behind the actions. Um, in this, he's kind of drawing off of the the sower in the the sower in the gospels, um, the parable. So he says, "I have watched farmers sowing the same type of seed, and yet each one had different ideas of what he was doing. One was planning to pay off his debts. Another was hoping to get rich. Another wanted to be able to bring gifts to honor the Lord." <coughs> Another was hoping to earn praise for his work from the passerby in life. Someone else wanted to irritate a jealous neighbor. While there was yet another who did not want to be reproached by men for laziness. And as for the seeds thrown in the earth, their names are fasting, keeping vigil, almsgiving, service, and such like. So let our brethren in the Lord keep careful eye on their motives. I think I love that last little part. Because we're, we're hearing all these things they're doing, and then we hear that he, he just lists off all the virtues. He's listing off that when, when we see it, we're seeing all this good stuff. And, and I think with myself that times where, where someone will praise me for doing something, it's like, that's a, that's a call to check our motives. Are we, why are we doing it? And um, so times that can be a very humbling thing when, when someone does praise us because we're seeing that my motives aren't lining up with what they're seeing. And, and so really that's, that's kind of God holding us accountable. And this is talks about discerning our true nature. And this is, this is really, to me, the fundamental thing of understanding this whole journey. Is we're, so we're leaving the passions and we're move, moving to the virtues. But the awesome thing is that the virtues aren't something that is out there that we're getting. It's something in here that we're uncovering. They, icons that have been around for, for centuries or millennia, we're, they, they go through this process of restoring them. They have fire damage and different things so they can slowly restore the icons. That's a good way of looking at us. We're icons of God, icons of Christ. And we... We also need restoring. So when we're obtaining these virtues, we're, that's being restored within us. So when he talks about that, he says, God neither caused nor created evil. And therefore, those who assert that certain passions come naturally to the soul are quite wrong. What they fail to realize is that we have taken natural attributes of our own and turned them into passions. For instance, the seed which we have for the sake of procreating children is a for by us for the sake of fornication. Nature has provided us with anger as something to be turned against the serpent, but we have used it against our neighbor. We have a natural urge to excel in virtue, but instead we compete in evil. Nature stirs within us the desire for glory, but that glory is the heavenly kind. It is natural for us to be arrogant against the demons. Joy is by our, ours by nature, but it should be joy on account of the Lord and for the sake of doing good to our neighbor. Nature has given us resentment, but that ought to be against the enemies of our souls. We have a natural desire for food, but surely not for extravagance. So we get there that, that these, and, and that can be the tendency. This is, this is how I naturally feel. This is my natural to overeat, to whatever, whatever the passion is. But he's saying that's not natural. That's, we think it's our natural state because we've lived so long being unnatural. And so he's calling us to turn to our nature and to more and more uncover it. Again, a spiritual father is going to help us uncover that because at times we're not able to see what our true nature is. So now I'm going to move on to steps 27 and 28, which is stillness and prayer. At this point, we're getting, we're getting up here. So, so whereas down here, we're preparing... At down here, we're, we're really rooting out a lot, of, a lot of our sickness, a lot of our passions. As we get up, we kind of make this shift. Um, 
we get it, we get about here, and and that shift turns to preparing for God, and not preparing as in just getting getting rid of passions, but preparing as in as in opening up to God. So stillness can kind of be looked at as that opening up and opening up to God and also to prayer. So we're it's really a state of being receptive. And he's going to, he talks a lot about quieting the mind, quieting the soul, quieting the body. Uh, we talk about it in the liturgy, we say, let us set aside all cares of life that we may receive the king of all. So, and that's, and that's as we lead into taking the Eucharist. So that's, we at that point, we are going to receive Christ and we set aside all cares. All the thoughts that keep going in our heads throughout the entire week, that's a, that's a point to, to let that go. He says, the start of stillness is the rejection of all noisiness as something that will trouble the depths of the soul. The final point is when one has no longer to fear noisy disturbance, when one is immune to it. Stillness is worshiping God unceasingly and waiting on Him. Let the remembrance of Jesus, which could be understood as a Jesus prayer, be present with your every breath. Then indeed you will appreciate the value of stillness. So another another thing in liturgy we hear is let us be attentive, let us attend, and this is a different type of prayer, a different type of preparation. We have we have a prayer books, we have the things that we say, or we have personal prayers. But this he's saying, let's take time to to set that all aside, set aside even good things, even good thoughts, set aside, uh, you know, your times in the week that you could be doing something that could be productive, and say. That can all happen, but right now is a time to be still before God. And, and even their prayers, even petitioning for, praying for those that are ill, whatever, you know, family members, have time for that, but also set aside this other time where we can still the mind and still the body. Father Tom talks a lot about saying the Jesus prayer, or even shortening that to Lord have mercy. And, and each time you're saying it, let those thoughts just... just go away, just settle, settle in and let those thoughts happen. And that's going to prepare us for, for, for God coming in. That, so that moves on to prayer. And as we've been able to still the, the mind and the body, that's going to open up this, this kind of last level of prayer. He talks about the, we have the Jesus prayer and, and those prayers where, where it's just a short little, it can even be a single word. And those are going to start bringing us down to that level of stillness. We also have our set prayers, our personal prayers. And then he talks about this other type of prayer that when, we, when we're able to get down to that level, he says it's going to end, find it here. He says the conclusion is rapture in the Lord. And then he explains that a little more. He explains two different types of rapture that we're going to experience when we get down to that level. He says it is one and the same fire that is called that which consumes and that which illuminates. Hence the reason why some emerge from prayer as from a blazing furnace, and as though having been relieved of all material defilements. <coughs> Others come forth as if they were resplendent with light and clothed in a garment of joy and humility. So that, that's, at times that's what we're going to feel. We're going to feel that sometimes it's burn on us, and that's going to be that refining process. At other times, we're going to feel that just overwhelming joy. We're going to feel the radiance from God. He, and again, he's, it's got to be personal. This isn't, this isn't something just to draw off someone else's experience. Someone else's experience is going to lead us to this state. So he says, you cannot learn to see just because someone tells you to do so. For that, you require your own natural power of sight. In the same way, you cannot discover the teaching of, from the teaching of others the beauty of prayer. Prayer has its own special teacher in God. He teaches man knowledge. He grants prayer of him who prays, and he blesses the ears of the just. So this is leading us to the final stage. There's, well, second, step 29 is dispassion. Step 30 is faith, hope, and love. You can understand faith, hope, and love. At that point, you are embracing, fully embracing Christ. This passion, that final step before faith, hope, and love, is where you are prepared. And so, his, his description of it I, I really like. He says, a dispassionate soul is immersed in the virtues as a passionate being is in pleasures. So we see there the contrast. 
Here we're completely immersed in the passions, passively giving ourselves over to control of that which is going to bring, bring us down. Now he's saying we are immersed in virtues which are drawing us up. We're, we're becoming more and more immersed in Christ. If the height of gluttony is that you force yourself to eat even when you're not hungry, then the height of temperance in a hungry man is that he restrains even the justifiable urges of nature. If the height of lechery is that one raves even over animals and over inanimate things, then the height of purity is to look on everyone in the same way, that one would regard inanimate objects. So and he goes on and on about this different, just contrasting, that this is where you were at, and when you get here, this is where you're going to be at. This is where your focus is going to be. These things that down here were driving you crazy, and you thought you would never overcome, you're going to hit that point through taking all these steps that you're no longer going to look at. They're not going to have that power over you because your power is going to come from Christ. And that's, you are a servant of Christ. You're not a servant to the passion. So, there, it's this transformation process that goes on and we eventually are getting that point where we're seeing our true nature. Whereas here we thought our true nature is the passion and we're trying to overcome our nature. The more and more we get, we draw to Christ, we're seeing, now I see my true nature. Now I see the true light within me. And that true nature eventually is going to lead us to union with God. So that's about all I had. Does anyone have any questions or comments?
that, that turns. For some people, they give up, but for others, there's this, this radiance that happens, and he really experienced that. Um, I think an Orthodox one would be Sultan Leibson would write about it. But it's, so on the one hand, we can look at it as, I don't, we have a, we have a different sense of human person now, so, so something like, like cleaning yourself is not, is not understood as really honoring to that image and likeness of God. Yet, at the same time, there is that sense where deprivation, which right now we're in Lent, right? So, when we're fasting, we're physically depriving our body, and that is preparing us for something. And, and we see with a lot of people who have these experiences of God that they're in a state of deprivation when they're having it. Um, another one would be Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky talks about he was an epileptic. And he, he had, before his seizures, he would have these moments of clarity and these moments of bliss. And he writes about him saying that he would trade, for one of those moments, he would trade his entire life. So, we're getting, it's, it's tough, you know, there's that suffering, there's that stuff that's going to sound really harsh to a modern ear. But at the same time, I think there is something in that that even today we can take away, even if we're not... You know, standing out in the rain for 24 hours and beating and stuff. So, does anyone else have thoughts? I was just curious, um, I, I missed the very beginning, but you talked about the latter. Is there also mention of cyclic nature of all of these states that you come to a certain place but then you end up back at the beginning? Or, or is it always just a linear motion? It's, I mean, it's linear, but it's also, you know, I just turned that way a little bit. Um, so, and Father Tom was bringing this up in his sermon, that, that as you're getting up, you're still, you're still having temptations that are pulling you down. You're never immune to them. And so, and St. John talks about these residual passions, these are temptations also, that will carry on, and they're, they're kind of safeguards, and that we're always tempted, and that temptation is going uh, to safeguard us against... The things that usually bring people down, we think of different leaders, right? What's what's a big temptation for a leader? It's pride. And you're not gonna you're not gonna feel that, that much when you're feeling that you know you're the ultimate sinner and, and in every way you understand yourself to be that. But as you get up here and you start experiencing some of that, you know, some of the virtues and you experience that sense of like, I've overcome some of this stuff, all of a sudden you have these other sins like pride that are gonna step up and so, not necessarily cyclical, but, but these things are going to keep coming up, and it's going to be in different ways. And some things that we haven't, we haven't thought are going to be, you know, a problem down here will be up here. So, if you're up like in the, in the upper echelons and then pride gets you to fall, do you have to start all over at the beginning? Or, or, um, or get it out? I, I guess I'd say, I mean, if you're, if you've fallen off, you know, using this, if you've fallen off the ladder, you've probably missed out on a lot of things as far as where your, your mistakes have been made. So that, that would just be kind of my thought on it, would be that if a, if a demon of whatever, whatever path is able to drag you down, there's probably been a lot of blind spots that you haven't been paying attention to. So, you know, you might, you might not, you know, might not be starting at the beginning, but you probably, there's a lot of steps that you skip that you're not, you haven't really conquered. Yes, Pat, you hit a part that really answered a question for me that, that I get all the time, and I wanted you to speak to a little bit. You talked about uh, anger being present, but being, but facing the wrong way, or at least being applied against your fellow person instead of the passion or whatever. And my question is, you know, I get this question a lot at work. Like, uh, uh, so if I'm looking at scripture and I see that Jesus overturned the tables uh, before he went to the temple, you know, that whole scene, or he uh, says, get me behind me, Satan, all of those places where people say, oh, look, see, Jesus got upset. Is what you said, wait a second, all he did was fashion that toward uh, where it was supposed to go? Like, that was a huge idea there. I just wanted you to speak to that. Yeah, um, 
I think I hope Father Collins will be mad. I remember, I think it was like a year ago or something, and, and Julie and I were meeting with him, and he said something, oh my gosh, guys, I, I can't believe I, and I think it was in the, the give back group or something, he, he used the F word, you know, and he's like, I'm a priest, like I can't say, you know, and I was thinking like, how, where, what did Father Tom, like in what circumstance did he use the F word? And, it was it was that it was a sense of anger towards and I think it was an addiction to someone's face. I mean, just the, the frustration that, of not being able to overcome it. Mm -hmm. And so that that anger that came out of Father Tom was directed towards that addiction. And so yeah, I see like it, it's interesting reading reading through Saint John today that he's talking about yeah it's, this this is it's not bad it's just directed the wrong way you know it's you shouldn't be angry at demons. And, and we look at, with ourselves, the things that we struggle to overcome, and there should be a sense of anger towards that. And then when we look at others who are, you know, I think of like when I, when I worked with, um, at Salvation Army, like the people that, that I would see that, you know, we spent three months and they're going through the program and then, boom, they're out on the streets just, you know, pissed drunk and, and their lives are just being destroyed. You know, they might die the next day. And it's like, you do, you get so ticked off about that. And it's not just ticked off at them, it's ticked off because you see that movement, you see them making it up here, and then to just have all that loss. So, does that kind of... Yeah, yeah, I guess it, it, so it can be, um, it can, it's not at the, uh, it's not at person, it's not the human person, it's not at, um, it's actually at the demon, so to speak. It's at the, it's righteous anger, I guess, or, or yeah, cause like zealous. If, yeah, because I mean, if you're if you're angry as a person, then, well, then you're you you're not understanding human right. nature as far right. as orthodoxy is concerned. Right. You're if but if you're angry at the demons, if you're angry at the passions, then you're understanding that even if the person is ruled by the passions, their true nature is still the virtues. Their true nature is still right. the united with Christ. So yeah. 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 Thank you. Alright, well thanks a lot. Thank you.